Hello there and welcome to Shots in the Quark. Today we'll be talking about a certain tiny length in physics. This length is known as the Planck length and it's the scale at which physics as we know it breaks down completely. Let's take a region of space. Okay, so on my whiteboard I have a region of space here. Now I ask the question, is there a region of space smaller than this one? Obviously the answer is yes, I can draw it here. Is there a region of space smaller than this one? Again, the answer is yes. I can draw one here. Now, on a large whiteboard like this, I could repeat this many, many times. But this poses a tantalising question. Is there a smallest region of space? If I were to keep on repeating this process, would I eventually arrive at some region of space that wasn't made up of any smaller regions? Would I arrive at some kind of atom of space, which can't be broken down any further? This is a fascinating question, but it's not one that the physics of today can fully answer. What we do know, however, is that there is indeed a smallest region of space in which the laws of physics as we know them still work. It turns out that there's a smallest region of space such that if we were to try and go any smaller, the laws of physics as we know them just break. This is what's known as the Planck length. It's the smallest length before all physics just breaks. How do we know this? Well, it turns out that we can derive the Planck length from some pretty basic considerations of quantum mechanics and general relativity. So that's what we're going to do. The story begins with a famous relation in quantum mechanics, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. This principle tells us that a particle cannot simultaneously have a precise position and a precise momentum. The mathematical form of it looks like this. We have that the uncertainty in a particle's position multiplied by the uncertainty in its momentum has got to be larger than some positive constant h bar. We can see that we can't ever know absolutely a particle's position because if we did then the uncertainty in its position would be zero, this left hand side would be zero and so the inequality clearly wouldn't be satisfied. Let's connect this to what we were saying before about there being a smallest length. Suppose that we want to consider a particle in some small region with size L. So here's my region, it's got size L, and we want to consider a particle just in this region. Well, if I want to consider this small region, then I need the uncertainty in the position of the particle to be smaller than this L. If the uncertainty was larger than L, then the particle could be found outside this small region. So what I need is the uncertainty in the position of the particle to be smaller than this length, L. We can substitute this requirement into the uncertainty principle to get a relation involving momentum. So if we do this, we get L, delta P is larger than H bar. Rearranging this a bit, we get that delta P has got to be larger than H bar over L. Squaring both sides, we can write delta P squared is larger than H bar squared over L squared. Now, because the mean value of momentum squared will always be larger than the uncertainty in momentum squared, in mathematical terms we have that p squared is larger than delta p squared, then we can rewrite this as p squared has got to be larger than h bar squared over L squared. If you didn't quite follow this last step, it doesn't really matter. The key point is this relation here. We now have that if we want to probe some very small distance L, it's going to involve very high momentum p. The smaller the distances we want to do physics on, the higher the momentums involved are going to be. Now, if our particle has a high enough momentum, then it will become relativistic. All this means for our purposes is that we can use a very simple formula for its energy. And that is, energy is momentum times the speed of light. So if we're trying to probe small enough length scales, then the momentum is going to become very high our particle becomes relativistic and we can use this formula. So substituting this formula into what we've derived from the uncertainty principle, we end up with the relationship that E squared, the energy of the particle squared, has got to be larger than H bar squared C squared over L squared. What this tells us now is that to probe very small length scales requires very high energies. Incidentally, this is exactly how particle accelerators like the Large Hadron Collider work. In order to probe very small length scales, they have to smash particles together at very, very high energies. 
This is all we need from quantum mechanics. Now let's combine it with some relativity. It turns out all we need is Einstein's very famous formula, E equals mc squared. This tells us that any energy behaves like a gravitating mass. So we can replace the energy in this inequality here with mass. This gives us that the mass squared has got to be larger than h bar squared over l squared c squared. Okay. This tells us then that if we want to probe very small length scales, then our particle is going to behave as if it has a very large gravitating mass. This is where problems are going to emerge. Now I'm sure you're all familiar with black holes. These are the strongest gravitating objects in the universe. If you have too much mass in too small a region, then a black hole will form. Now, every object has a special length associated with it, called its Schwarzschild radius. The Schwarzschild radius is written like this, r equals gm over c squared. g and c are just constants, and m is the mass of the object that we're considering. The Schwarzschild radius tells us the, the length that we'd have to squash this object down in order for it to form a black hole. For example, our sun has a Schwarzschild radius of about three kilometers. This tells us that in order for our sun to form a black hole, we'd need to compress it down to a sphere of radius three kilometers. Returning to our particle in its small region, we can see from this relationship that this particle is going to have some gravitating mass. And this gravitating mass is going to be larger than this quantity here. So what we need to be careful of now, if we want to do physics with this particle in this small region, we need to be careful that this particle doesn't form a black hole. And this will only be the case if this region, L, is larger than the particle Schwarzschild radius. So what we need is for L to be larger than G times the mass of the particle divided by C squared. If the region that we're working in is smaller than this, then the particle will form a black hole and this region will be hidden behind an event horizon. After doing some algebra, we end up with a remarkable result. If we want to do physics with a particle in a small region, then there's a lower bound on the size of it. We can't do physics at length scales less than this quantity because below this length, particles collapse into their own black holes. And so regions of this size will be obscured, hidden behind the event horizon of a black hole. This here is the Planck length. Below this length, all of our physics just breaks. So what does this mean for physics? It means that if we want to know anything about what happens below this length scale, we need to have a unified theory of quantum mechanics and general relativity. We need a theory of quantum gravity if we're to understand whether we can go below this length or whether this length here is really the smallest possible length in the universe and that on this scale, instead of seeing a smooth fabric of space, you instead have some kind of space-time atoms. At this point in time, nobody really knows what happens to physics below this length scale. Whatever the answer is though, it's sure to be fascinating. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you now have a better idea of what the Planck length is and why it's so interesting. Please like and subscribe for more. Shots in the Quark.